Enemy fleets, rambling salvages, and an incoming supernova. The 2380s in the Star Trek universe was a fraught time, shall we say. Many were still recovering from the damage inflicted by the Dominion War. Whatever that is, we've never covered that before. But one of the most difficult situations during this decade was the Romulan Star, which unnaturally started to show signs of a supernova. And this, in turn, necessitated the construction of a whole pile of rescue ships named after a very obscure kind of cake. Look, it's going to be Battenberg in my brain forever. You can still call them Wallenberg if you like, but to me, they are cake ships. Just deal with it. With Romulus suddenly facing its destruction, Starfleet created an entire armada to save as many T uh, lives as possible. Tragically, this fleet would find itself destroyed before it could even fully set out on its most notable mission of saving the Romulan people, but at least the entire fleet wasn't suddenly intercepted and swallowed whole by a small dog. I miss Douglas Adams. Starfleet may have turned its back on the Romulan people, but neither would Ambassador Spock or Commodore Geordi LaForge, who worked together to create the Romulan Salvation. The silliest ship in Star Trek history, the Jellyfish. Yes, that is a real ship name. Welcome to Trek Central, Lords, Ladies and Sovereigns. I am your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam. And as always, before we warp into the main video, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. And quick, what ship should we focus on next? 2023 has been a grand year for us, but we leave that particular question with you all. So yes, the jellyfish. The Vulcan Science Academy constructed the prototype around the mid-2380s. Its designer was actually Geordi LaForge, who, after coming off a nearly half-decade stint working at the Utopia Planitia shipyards to construct the fleet of Battenberg-class transport ships for the relocation of the Romulan people in systems affected by the Romulan supernova. This ship was only designed for a single occupant, so it was very, very wee, about 54.25 meters long. The ship was uniquely constructed at Vulcan to save the Romulan people from the impending supernova. The design kept some typically Vulcan elements to it, namely its curves in its structure. Though differing from Vulcan design, the hull of the ship was white compared to their usual reddish-brown hull coloration. The structure of the jellyfish was made up of a main module that was crescent-shaped, standing vertically. However, the ship had two different configurations. While it was in flight mode, this crescent structure stood vertically straight up. However, when the vessel wanted to land, it would rotate 90 degrees into a horizontal position. When the ship did land, it had landing gear and extended a boarding ramp for access to its interior. The rotating crescent section was attached to a central axis which had a drive section at the rear. The warp and sublight capabilities of this ship looked different than other space travel components of other Federation vessels at the time, Namely, in that it did not have conventional warp nacelles or impulse engines. This was connected to the drive section of the ship, which looked like the tail, and featured two rotating sections that spun in opposite directions. The outer rotating section was elongated along the spine of the ship and curved. The inside of this, almost tentacle-like structure, was lined with components which assisted in the propulsion of the ship. The inner rotating section was sorted and extended more perpendicular to the other rotating section. How the drive section worked, though, as you can probably tell from all that gibberish I just threw at you, is a bit of a mystery. The center of the drive section did emanate a white light, which looked almost like a flame. Uh, maybe it ran on hopes and dreams? Maybe. Probably not. But maybe. As the jellyfish was only a one-man vessel, the interior of the ship was extremely sparse. The main element of the interior was a central circular room which housed the red matter containment system, which was able to safely contain red matter, which is a very, very volatile and highly destructive substance. This containment system also had a feature which allowed for the safe extraction of a small amount of red matter, which could then be deposited into a torpedo or another payload delivery system, such as the Narada's mining charges, to deliver the payload of red matter to its target, whether that be an exploding supernova or a planet. Or anything else, I suppose, that you need destroyed by an artificial black hole. This room was connected to the main cockpit of the vessel, with a command chair shaped like a triangle, which, when looked at, connected with the spherical window of the ship, making a Vulcan Idic symbol. 
as Zachary Quinto said. Fascinating. The ship was said to be the fastest of the Vulcan Science Academy fleet. However, the top warp speed of this vessel was actually only warp 8, Starfleet having vessels that could reach much higher warp thresholds. It could be that this was either the fastest one-man vessel or just the fastest of the Vulcan science ships, perhaps as Vulcan vessels still employed circular warp drives. The jellyfish could be programmed to accept input from only voice print analysis from its pilot and facial recognition. It was programmed with Ambassador Spock as its pilot in the movie, but this did not account for alternate timelines, with their Spocks also seemingly being allowed to pilot it as well. Voice print and face recognition analysis enabled. Welcome back, Ambassador Spock. Oh, that's weird. I wonder if a changeling disguised as Ambassador Spock could also have been allowed to control it, or if the ship's computer made other checks. The ship was also equipped with phasers and torpedoes for offensive capabilities because a planet-exploding molecule is not enough these days. Just give it a portal gun as well while you... Oh, uh, never mind. It was also said to have transmetaphasic shielding, which could protect the ship from the forces near a star's corona. Metaphasic shielding was eventually incorporated into Starfleet ships as standard, with at least the Neo Constitution class and the Enterprise G, Ne Titan A, having metaphasic shielding equipped. After a critical food coloring to dilithium ratio failure of the Federation Romulan relocation effort, okay, fine, no more cake ship jokes, I'm sorry, and the first contact day attack of 2385 by rogue synthetics hacked by a Romulan cabal known as the Jat Vash. The Romulans didn't have much hope left. But at least they had cake. Damn it. I just can't help myself. The Romulan Star Empire continued to look for planets to relocate to quickly, but these efforts were hampered by former paranoia at their neighboring factions and also trying to ensure that their borders were protected during this tumultuous time. Wait, was that the Dominion War? Somebody really needs to explain that whole thing to me. I've got no idea what you're on about. Anyway, in 2386, the USS Titan would be involved in an incident along the Federation Romulan border, and its commanding officer, William T. Riker, would be held by a Romulan tribunal after the destruction of two Tal Shiar Enforcer-class cruisers. Ambassador Spock would lead the defense for Riker, and would manage to get the charges against him dropped. Ambassador Spock would then ask for a favor from Captain Riker. The Ambassador had initiated a collaboration between the Vulcan Science Academy and Romulus into seeking a solution that might preserve the Romulan civilization. The Ambassador wished that Riker would connect him with Geordi LaForge. LaForge was a very gifted engineer and shipwright, as we've seen, and Spock, having read several of his warp propulsion theory monographs with interest. LaForge was involved with the Romulan relocation effort at the time, making sure the fleet of Wallenberg transport vessels was constructed in time and was fortunately off-world when Mars was attacked. Geordi LaForge would later go on to design and create the Jellyfish, the fastest ship of the Vulcan Science Academy, which would be able to deliver a payload of red matter in order to generate an artificial black hole, which, in theory, would absorb the Romulan star. My question, though, is what happens after that? Well, though this plan would leave the Romulan system without its sun, it would give the Romulan people time to come up with plans and save everyone on the planet without having to leave their borders unprotected. This vessel would be completed in the next year, 2387. Spock would then use the jellyfish to inject red matter into the supernova, resulting in the creation of a black hole that absorbed it. While the plan succeeded, Spock was unfortunately too late to stop it from destroying Romulus. As Spock attempted to depart, he was intercepted by the Romulan mining vessel Narada, and both ships were pulled into the black hole. The Narada emerged from the tunnel through space-time in 2233 and catalyzed the alternate reality, whereas the jellyfish exited the black hole 25 years later. Nero, the captain of the Narada, would capture the jellyfish and Spock and use its red matter to destroy the planet Vulcan in revenge for Spock failing to save his world and force Spock to watch his planet be destroyed from the nearby planet of Delta Vega. Nero would go on to try and destroy Earth, another faction that had failed to save the Romulan people in the Prime Timeline. However, through a joint effort from this new timeline's Kirk and Spock, the new timeline Spock would retrieve the jellyfish, which would let him pilot it, recognizing that he was Spock Prime, 
and would pilot it on a collision course with the Narada. This ignited the store of red matter inside the ship, causing an artificial black hole to destroy the Narada with a little help from the Enterprise to make sure the Narada would not continue to time travel and cause even more damage. Though the jellyfish was not named on screen, it was given the name of jellyfish in the script, and for all we know, might have actually been called something more Vulcan in origin. Though since it was designed by Jolie LaForge, he might have been the one to name it. Multiple different concept artists worked on the jellyfish under production designer for Star Trek 2009, Scott Chambliss. Scott envisioned the ship as having sophisticated technology married with organic things, and saying it might even be a technology Vulcans grow, like a plant of high tensile steel. The visual effects supervisor of 09, Roger Guyot, said that the ship's warp signature was intended to evoke clean, green energy, in contrast to the burned, dirty fuel aesthetic of the Narada, which I think was definitely achieved in the final product. Brian Hitch, a comic book artist and massive Star Trek fan, was brought on very early on to design the jellyfish. This was before a script was even made, with only a rough story outline and the concept of a one-man Vulcan ship, which would carry red matter to stop a supernova. Some of Brian's earliest concepts are extremely different from the end result, but are very interesting, with a lot more noticeably conventional Federation designs in the ship, but still retaining that almost organic nature to it. Brian's favorite trek is Deep Space Nine, good taste there, so he took a lot of inspiration from the risks that DS9 did with its ship designs. This design would be made into a basic CG model by Brian's friend Neil Bushnell. Brian would, however, make a design which was essentially the final version we see on screen. What is interesting about this design, however, is that what we know now to be the cockpit of the ship was originally envisioned to be the place where the red matter would be shot out of. The concept of the rotating parts was also inspired by the moving nacelles of the USS Voyager. Concept artist Nathan Schroeder took a shot at doing some concept art for the jellyfish too, which kept this rotating-like idea for the ship, but made it look much more like a combination of ship components, rather than the smoother, more nature-like version we got in the end. Then came Ryan Church, who also did some designs of the jellyfish, but a lot of these, though keeping the look of Brian Hitch's angel ship design, looked much more organic than the final version. Ryan also made some designs with more translucent hulls, actively inspired by the look of real jellyfish. Those designs do look very cool and might have inspired the blue particle look that emanates from the drive section of the ship. Nathan did not just do the ship's exterior, but did some concept art for the interior as well, which was also much different from what we finally got. His designs, one labeled as Jellyfish Corridor, gives the idea that the ship was probably much larger at one point in time than the one-man 54.25 meter vessel we ended up with. The corridor is very sci-fi and heads toward a red light, which I presume was where the red matter was stored. The jellyfish did not have a transporter system. However, there was concept art for one, and it is said this was included in the script, which was inevitably cut. This is a very different transporter system than we've ever seen before, but it does make me think of both the small transporter system of the Enterprise NX-01 combined with the lateral transport system of the USS Shenzhou from Star Trek Discovery. And if you take a very close look at an interesting little detail in this concept art, the map on the console has Dominion, Cardassian, Bajoran, and Starfleet symbols. Yay, Easter eggs. Nathan Schroeder was also the artist who made the cockpit look like a Vulcan idic. And that, ladies, gents, and sovereigns, is the jellyfish. The ship that not only stopped the Romulan supernova, but also inadvertently created a whole other timeline. What do you think of this interesting vessel? Not the timeline! Let us know in the comments below, because as always, if you're talking Trek, we would love to hear it. And if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, you know what to do. Make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central, and you can follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. For now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends. Cake.